Here we are, 20th century, number 45, Catholic theological tradition. We are on outline 7a, if you're following this along as a course for the Catholic Distance University. Um, if you're not following this as, as a student, I encourage you to think about becoming a student of Catholic Distance University. Great courses, undergrad, grad, credit, uh, or continuing ed, great opportunities for learning. Okay, 20th century. 20th century is another tumultuous time, as was the 19th. 19th, a century of revolution and warfare. 20th century, uh, unfortunately, is even worse. So let's talk about theology, though. The, the trouble that everyone's having theologically is how do we deal with modern Secular humanism, modern philosophy, modern science, how do we respond to this? We saw that the 19th century had some Protestant responses of liberalism. Uh, we see the response of romantic theology. Um, but now we're going to talk about a Catholic response. And that response is, has been labeled, not by the people involved in it, but by those who attack it as modernism. Modernism is just a loose uh, label applied to a number of Catholic scholars in the early part of the 20th century who endeavored to somehow integrate aspects of modern science, particularly biblical science, and modern philosophy into Catholic theology. And uh, quite frankly, a number of them went over the line. A number of them sold out the tradition, much like Protestant liberal and Protestant romantic, sold out biblical Christianity and, and fidelity to saying the creed and really meaning it. You know, so the, the modernists in, in the Catholic camp, there were some that were extreme. One was Alfred Loisy, a scripture scholar, who was skeptical, dry as, as dust, <laughs> critical, just like Protestant biblical scholars. Um, he ended up being condemned. He ended up leaving the priesthood, so that wasn't very good fruit. Then there's another theologian, a Jesuit, by the name of George Tyrell. And George Tyrell imitated, he wasn't a Bible scholar, he was more imitating um, the symbolism of a guy like Schleiermacher, that, you know, we don't throw out Catholic doctrine, we got to understand it in a much more symbolic way, rather than it meaning what we think it means, or meaning literally that Jesus rose from the dead, or, you know, or the coming judgment, heaven and hell, we got to understand these things differently. So this is really heterodox, and therefore it, we, we see condemnation coming, um, and the condemnations come from Pope Pius X, who succeeds Leo. Pope Pius X, who is a saint, uh, we're going to talk a little bit more about his contributions later, but he sees the, the danger in these radical modernists, and so there's a condemnation of modernism defined as a sellout of the tradition. So he carefully defines what is unacceptable and condemns that in two documents, Lamentabili Sani Exi to and Pascendi Domini Gregis. So you don't need to remember necessarily the names of those things, but you do need, need to remember modernism. And that modernism is condemned. However, here's the problem. There's a lot of really good people that are doing good sort of dialoguing and trying to integrate the tradition. If you remember, this is the same problem as Aristotelianism appearing on the scene back in the 13th century. You got some people who go too far, the Latin of Aroists. They have to be condemned. Then you have some people who say anybody who touches anything of, of, of Aristotle is committing a sacrilege, desecrating the Catholic tradition. It won't fit. It's secular. It's, you know, so there's intransigent sorts of conservatives who will not dialogue with or integrate anything. And then you have various people who do a critical assimilation, like a Bonaventure, like Albert the Great, like Thomas. Okay, well, you got the same thing going on here, the same story. It, it really, it's always is happening, where you have people who sell out the tradition for the modern culture, you know, this problem of Christ and culture. Then you have others who say, no dialogue with the culture, we're just doing things the way we always, always did things. And so you have a number of anti-modernists, they take uh, 
what the Pope has said, and now they use it as a club against the, the people that are called also, they call modernists, but are people who are not compromising the tradition. So who are they? There's a philosopher, a very pious Catholic philosopher from France named Maurice Blondel, and he, he's not a theologian. Uh, he's a philosopher, but he's doing tremendous work in explaining things ultimately in a way that help us understand what tradition is. Down the road, he, his philosophy is going to be used um, to help elabor elaborate the theology of tradition. But at this point in time, this pious man who's a daily communicant is thrown in with these other modernists and his name goes under a cloud and he, he you know, has problems. There's another beautiful and pious and holy man named Friedrich von Hugel. He's a layman. He is a theologian and he tries tries to be a bridge figure. He tries to get dialogue going between the more extreme modernists and others in the church. He himself, a very fine man, not guilty. So the modernist label is applied rather broadly by enemies of the movement, and some of the, some of the, the people deserve a label. And some people really don't deserve that label, and they don't fall under the condemnations of Pope Pius X, but others think they do. And so th these guys are persecuted. The Ecole Biblique now in Jerusalem has to be very careful because people waiving the condemnations of Pius X start accusing opinions coming out of uh, Père Lagrange as being modernist. So now the, the problem here is a witch hunt starts and a lot of very good people who have been approved and encouraged by the preceding Pope are not condemned by the Pope, but by those zealots who are thinking they're doing the Pope Pius X's will. So it, it, it's a, there's an anti-modernist oath that priests need to take after this period of time. There are people in the, uh, the at this point, the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith is called the Holy Office of the Inquisition. And it was named that way back in the days of the Inquisition it still has that name and they still proceeded in a certain way uh, according to inqui inquisition sort of of approaches of keeping secret files on people and there are a lot of really good people who had files on them in the holy office because they were suspected of modernism so anybody who said anything positive about historical critical scholarship or you know about uh, anything positive about any philosophy other than saint thomas's you know any modern philosophy philosophy or, or science, you know, they're accused of modernism. That, that was one of the problems. And when I say they're accused, they're not being accused now by the Pope. They're being accused by maybe some people in the Curia, maybe some conservative prelates or religious superiors. So that's, that's part of what's going on. And uh, it leads, uh, we'll talk about the movement that, 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 that it's called later, okay? Um, right now, I want to talk about a Protestant reaction to liberalism. You know, modernism is one Catholic reaction that tries to mimic, in some ways, some people mimic liberalism and romantic theology, others are trying an authentic critical assimilation. In Protestantism, you have a, a pretty sorry situation of a lot of theologians and biblical scholars who've seemingly sold out um, this basic teaching of the faith, such as that Jesus really died and rose again, and that we really needed salvation, uh, the original sin, the virgin birth of Mary. You know, these liberals are explaining all these things away. So you have a movement to recapture the fundamentals of the faith. And there's a series that's written, um, uh, and it's from Princeton University, coming out of uh, Calvinist Christian tradition. You know, Princeton is a, originally founded by the Puritans. So out of Princeton comes these uh, tracks called The Fundamentals. We're talking 1909 as the beginning of this series of tracks uh, on The Fundamentals. What are The Fundamentals? I just mentioned them all. Um, uh, and there, I, there's a few more, you know, Final Judgment, uh, Verbal Inerrancy, and inspir Verbal Inspiration of Scripture and Inerrancy of Scripture. That's really the key because when that's challenged, then you can really uh, uh, reinterpret all the doctrines. So it, all these doctrines hinge for these people because they're Protestant, not on magisterium, um, not on church councils, but on the verbal inerrancy, uh, inspiration and inerrancy of scripture. Um, so that these, these are the things they're fighting for. And this is the movement that, be, that becomes fundamentalism. This is where fundamentalism starts in the United States. Okay. 
So the problem is that there is such an overemphasis on the divinity of Christ that there's a neglect of his humanity. There's such an emphasis on the divinity of sacred scripture that there's overlooking of the humanity. Now, it, again, it's an extreme reacting to the extreme of Protestant liberalism, romantic theology, historical critical scholarship that is so emphasizing the humanity of scripture that all eternal truth withers away. You know, the divine coming through the human is forgotten. Uh, these are all human words to be reinterpreted now or just simply accepted as being, you know, hopelessly outdated and, and you know, something we can't apply to today's life. You know, I mean, you still hear that kind of argument on the part of many people. But um, the, so the fundamentalist idea, it starts in the academy. It's not anti-intellectual. It, it's really trying to reassert um, and argue for and fight for the foundations of faith, but it's grounding them in a very strict inerrancy approach. And so you can't get anywhere near inspiration and inerrancy or, or you'll, you'll, everything will collapse. And therefore, there's, there's a denial of the fact that, for example, you have to argue that scripture, if it's inerrant, for these folks, it would mean, you know, if, if Scripture says the world was created in seven days, it was created in, in six days, and God rests on the seventh, it happened exactly that way. If, if the world is 6,000 years old, if you use, you know, dating from the Bible, then the, the dinosaurs can't be real. So it ends up leading to an anti-intellectualism. Um, as, as it grows, you know, against evolutionary teaching, against, uh, you know, Charles Darwin and, and you know, science and, and trying to find proofs for Noah's Ark and, you know, all this kind of stuff. So that, that's the problem. And, and it, it led to a battle within a lot of denominations. Um, you can see from a Catholic standpoint, it's a battle, just like the anti-modernist battle, it's an important battle to fight. We, we don't want to sell out and, lead and, and just um, relativize, neutralize the doctrines of the church. I mean, that's, that's crazy. It's suicide. But on the other hand, if you use the wrong kind of defense, that also puts you into trouble. And that's what's happening with um, the Catholics who are fighting against modernism. They're called integralists. The integralists... Uh, or integralism is like fundamentalism, you know, not wanting to uh, give, uh, surrender good things, but by the same token, identifying those good things with a particular culture, with the culture that we've just received, theology that we've just received. We, we don't want to, we have to preserve everything as we've received it from the last generation, whole and entire, integral. And therefore, you know, don't allow anything in from the modern world that can corrupt it. Okay, so we've got two movements in Catholic and Protestant thinking that are now kind of drawing a line and saying we don't want any, the modern world to get involved with us at all. We've got to protect ourselves and protect the, the heritage of the faith from the modern world. So that's what we got with fundamentalism. That's what we got with integralism. Okay, so it sets up a pretty difficult situation. Um, is there a middle ground? Yeah. Uh, in the ancient Greek world, you know, there were, the, there were two cliffs on either side of a narrow strait through which Odysseus had to sail. Scylla and Charybdis, get, get too close to either one, you get destroyed, you know, so you have to try to navigate through the two. So that's what uh, many people are trying to do uh, in, in this situation. In, in the Protestant world, we're going to talk about the Protestant attempt to, to get to critical, for critical assimilation, for avoiding these two extremes, you know, of a, of a embrace of modern culture that destroys the faith and closing the do door to mo modern culture and kind of an anti-intellectual uh, stance. So anyway, here's what we got. We got in the Protestant world something that arises called neo-orthodoxy. Neo-orthodoxy emerges right after World War I, and World War I really ends the 19th century. World War I is the horrible fruit of 19th century naive optimism. This idea of the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man, and we're making progress, and society and humanity are evolving. There was this naive belief in that. Um, and if you read th those who were lead who were rah-rah cheering World War I, they thought it was going to be this little gentlemanly conflict that would be over quickly. Um, they had no idea the horror that would be unleashed by this 
pointless war um, that involved so many and destroyed so many lives and, and destroyed the landscape. Um, the, the modern warfare for the first time with heavy guns, with tanks, with mustard gas. I mean, the carnage was unbelievable. <coughs> and it really buried this naive optimism that liberal Protestant theology had helped to encourage. The liberal Protestant theologians in Germany all were on board with World War I, all were supporting the war effort. And there was a, a Swiss um, theologian, Karl Barth, who saw this and it just made him sick. It made him doubt the whole thing that he had learned in seminary from these guys who he studied with. And he came forth with um, what's called Protestant neo-orthodoxy. Neo-Orthodoxy, Karl, Karl Barth basically uh, came out with a commentary on Romans. Remember, Luther begins the Reformation with a commentary on Romans. So he does a new commentary on Romans and basically recovers the radical um, difference between God and man. You know, radical submission to God, a realization of humanity's weakness and nothingness before God, and sin and need for grace, uh, rediscovering of God's transcendence. He talks about an infinite question qualitative difference between God and man. Um, you know, this brotherhood of man, fatherhood of God deal where God's kind of tame and he, almost the God, the deist God far away. Uh, no, not for Bart. Bart recovers the Christian uh, vision of God as being having a claim on us, being involved in us, calling us to change. Um, this is called dialectical theology. And some of the other people involved in this, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, the cost of discipleship. If you have ever chance, that's a good one to read. Read. Um, he was the first one. And nowadays, discipleship is a buzzword. He really got that going in a in a big way with this book. Um, there are other people who are on this bandwagon, but are very still uh, um, embrace a very liberal approach to the Bible. Rudolf Bultmann. Bultmann goes in for calling people to repentance and to radical faith, but he explains away all the resurrection of Jesus and everything else in Scripture. He demythologizes scripture. He's a New Testament scholar. So it's kind of a dichotomy. On the New Testament scholar side, he demythologizes everything. Um, and on the, the, the side of a theologian, he's calling everyone to radical discipleship. It doesn't seem to make a lot of sense. Um, but anyway, that's the movement that's going on. You can see people are groping and trying to, to handle and trying to integrate and trying to make sense of, yeah, I know this is our tradition. And I know this modern stuff, there's some value in it. And there's some that's really bad and I'm trying to sort it all out. So that's what's going on in the, the Protestant world. In the Catholic world, there's something going on that's much, I think, more fruitful and much more moderated. Uh, after the bad modernists are condemned, they kind of slither away and um, th there's a, a, a bit of a chill on creative scholarship. But by the 30s, the 1930s, there's a, a kind of a re-energizing, kind of the, the renewal that started in the 19th century gets some new legs and gets some new wind and really takes off and that's what we're going to talk about in the next video.